Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to EE380, the Computer Systems Laboratory Colloquium. Today's speaker is Jerry Ellsworth, a self-taught VLSI designer who's going to talk to us about her remake of the 1980s Commodore 64. So how many of you had a Commodore 64 as a kid, as a kid or as an adult? <laughs> okay. How many of you still have one? That's almost the exact same number. <laughs> so how many of you really had one when you were a kid and don't just have one now? Okay, now that's only like two people. That's amazing. <laughs> Actually, I was the first uh, educational program on a big 20. Does that count? Wow. So that's pretty good, too. So our speaker today um, actually did not start off in VLSI design with any formal training. She had an interest in electronics as a child and was also interested in playing with 8-bit computers. Um, but then, not being challenged enough by these things, she went into car racing and also to, into um, chassis fabrication. After doing these things for a while, she started her own company, which was a chain of computer stores that she ran. And while doing this, she met a lot of different interesting people, some of whom became her mentors, and she was learning different things from them, and decided to sell the chain of these stores and go into VLSI design. This has resulted in her laughing. But <laughs> <laughs> this is all true, right? Yes, okay, yes. Good. So this has resulted in the remake of the Commodore 64. There's actually been two different remakes. The first one is the Commodore 1, and then the second one is called the C64 Direct-to-TV, which was in a joystick. So she'll be talking about those things today. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. It's going to be an interactive presentation. And please welcome Jerry Ellsworth. Hi. Hi, I'm pretty excited to be here. This is uh, it's, uh, really an honor to come talk to uh, Stanford uh, students. I, uh, I, it, it's, it feels kind of funny being a high school dropout and not going to college you know, come here and talk to, you know, the cream of the crop. You know, I, I often go through um, Stanford website and look at their web seminars and see, you know, what kind of stuff you guys are learning here. And it's just um, fantastic. Um, so, uh, you know, preparing for this, this talk, I had to decide whether I was going to do a technical subject or more about my life experiences. And it, it took me a long time to... Um, to decide on, you know, exactly what I was going to talk about. And in the end, I decided that, you know, my life experiences are probably more valuable than any technical subject that I could tell you because you know, you've probably heard it a thousand times before in your other um, BLSI classes. Um, so, yeah, maybe I'll give you some, you know, stats about, uh, about me. I'm 30 years old. Um, I've been doing uh, chip design, FPGA design, for only three years now, three or four years. And prior to that, it was all hobby electronics. Um, so I, I think the best way to go about this is to, to explain the motivation behind, you know, why I do the things that I've done and, um, you know, explain how I got started when I was younger and then how I progressed through my life. And I uh, try to keep it short. I'll we'll try to keep it less than three hours this time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, can, I can ramble, so we've got to be careful. So I was raised in Oregon, a very small town. Um, the way outside of town, it was a small kind of farmhouse, nine miles away from town, to, um, very few people around. Um, single father raising me and my brother. And uh, I spent a lot of time alone and uh, had to entertain myself a lot. Uh, the, uh, I, I really, I, I started off very young, um, you know, on a track to do electronics. Um, I was always fascinated with how things worked. So, you know, every toy that I got, um, I would tear it apart. It was very frustrating for my dad because he'd go get this fancy, you know, speak and spell or something, and I would just rip it apart and uh, look inside of it, and and uh, it, I wouldn't put it back together half the time. <clears throat> so 
eventually my father gave up on trying to um, stop me from taking things apart and actually encouraged me to to take things apart by um, at his business he had a gas station um, he would have a box there that was Jerry's box and he would let his customers know that if they ever had any broken electronics that they could bring it by and put it in the box and donate it to the um, Jerry Tear Apart Fund or whatever. <laughs> so I had, at one point um, I stopped getting um, you know, presents like other kids would get. I wouldn't get um, you know, regular toys. I would just get this box of old VCRs, toasters. Um, it was great fun. I would rip them apart, scatter the parts all over the, um, the house, which caused problems at times. You know, one time my dad stepped on a, a flywheel and capstan out of a, a tape deck and impaled his foot. And uh, so, you know, there were a couple times that my dad made me purge, you know, all of my electronics and, and mechanical stuff. Um, I had to try to keep it to my room um, most of the time. And my room was just this incredible disaster area, stacks of circuit boards and, you know, bits and pieces and I had my, I find it funny now, I would collect electronic parts, but I really didn't understand how they worked. So I would, you know, take my um, wire cutters and I would cut the uh, leads right at the base of the, the part. And I'd put them all in little baggies and in little trays. You know, they were totally worthless because they had no leads on them. Yeah, and even I was trying to be an entrepreneur at times. I would put them in little bags and take them to school and try to sell them to the other kids for like a nickel or something. <laughs> Uh, I didn't sell many. What was that? That would probably work down here if I was down here. <laughs> if I was only around uh, the high nerd factor down here, that would have been great. So, uh, yeah, my room was my favorite place on earth. It was my, my lab where I created things or tore things apart. Um, uh, I hadn't, for quite a few years when I was younger, probably until I was eight or nine, I didn't, um, didn't have any experience with computers and really didn't have much desire to learn about computers until um, we went over to one of my father's friend's house. And his son had a TI-99 4A. And they, they were, I guess, trying to shut me up or something, get me in the back room so I would play on that thing and leave them alone. So they put me back on this thing. They fired it up, and it came up to a, a basic prompt. It had a basic interpreter in it. And I sat there for two or three hours typing things like, draw house, and it would say, syntax error. <laughs> Paint house, syntax error. But it didn't matter to me. I was, they were just so magical. I knew that I'd eventually give it a command that it would do some kind of really cool you know, graphics or a video game, like start video game. And uh, so that was really cool. And I was, so I was very excited to go back to my dad's friend's house with him so I could play on the TI-99. So uh, at, at one point, the, the son of my dad's friend uh, took me back there and gave me the programmer's manual on it. And we entered a program, Mr. Bojangles, that was just a little dancing guy on the screen that just danced back and forth. And it's like, ah, oh, now that's how you program a computer. Now I know. So I started just devouring the book and figuring out. And pretty soon I had, um, you know, steamrollers coming on the screen and running Mr. Bojangles over. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and jet fires. I, it's hard for me to remember exactly, maybe eight, nine, somewhere in there. Um, so I had to have a computer. So I just, you know, begged my dad, begged him, please, I need a computer. I need a computer. We'd go to the shopping mall or shopping center, and I would drag him off to the, um, to the computer section. And I didn't care what computer. I was just like, oh, how about this one? How about this one? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, and he would say things like, well, you would just tear it apart, <clears throat> which he was probably right. But. <laughs> and so... Um, yeah, you know, at this time he he was starting his small business, so he didn't have a lot of money. But you know, he felt it was important that um, the kids learn about um, computers. So he he stretched and he bought however many thousands it was to buy a Commodore 64 complete setup, and that was my first computer. And uh, 
So, you know, to keep me from tearing it apart, he, he kept it upstairs and said it was for my brother, kept it up uh, away from me so it didn't go into the dungeon or the void or whatever you want to call it. And uh, so I, I started uh, learning how to program. The computers, electronics was still really magical at this time. I, I was starting to learn a little bit about, you know, flashlights. You know, you put an LED in the flashlight or something instead of a light bulb or um, various things like that. So I, I remember on my Commodore 64, we had a video game cartridge for it. And I thought the cartridge just made connections between pins on this edge connector as you plugged it in, and it would just magically make these games. So I thought if I could make the right connections by jamming forks and rusty nails or whatever was available <laughs> into the cartridge port, flip it on. And it was encouraging because, you know, all these wonderful magical colors would come up on the screen. <laughs> yeah. It's like I must be close. So this is something I kept trying to do, kept trying to do. And eventually I blew out my little Commodore 64 and he had to go get it fixed. And, of course, he's like, how did it get broken? I said, I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah, I wasn't very bright, so, you know, he got it fixed, brought it back, and probably within a week I started doing the same thing, blew it out again. I, I must have blew it out two or three times, you know, trying to do stuff like that to it. And uh, eventually he uh, took it back and got a different model. He was like, oh, it's just that bad model of it. Like, okay. And... Uh, so I, I guess the warranty on it at one point um, expired and he couldn't get it fixed. And I ended up breaking it somehow by probably jamming a screwdriver into it. And it was dead. And I, I loved this computer because I would come home from school and I would just stare into the television set with it. You know, they hooked them to televisions back then, a nice blurry black and white thing. And I would stare at it until um, my eyes glazed over and... Uh, but I was really sad when it was broke. I had nothing to do. So out came the screwdrivers, and I opened it up, and I found out there was just a little fuse inside that uh, had blown. Um, so apparently I'd been shorting out one of the power lines by jamming the screws in, or the metal into it. So I wrapped some tin foil around it, put it right back <laughs> on it. <laughs> and I was back in business. <laughs> so... Uh, eventually, I started putting things back together, and um, that was a big, big step. Um, you know, up to that point, I mainly just took things apart, and you know, they never went back together. So, you know, I, for some reason, I felt that I should start putting these things back together, and you know, some of the stuff worked um, the same way it did when I took it apart. Some didn't, and it was a big, it was a really a good learning experience at that point to try to get the stuff to work again. And um, I eventually progressed to where I could start changing things. Um, you know, like I had a calculator that I found that if you touched parts of it, um, it would calculate really slowly because, you know, now I know I was messing with the RC oscillator in it and uh, slowing it way down. So I found, oh, I started swapping those parts out and, uh, you know, putting stuff across them. And it's like, wow, neat, I can make it run, uh, calculate faster, it appears. And, so early overclocking, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I was also fascinated with what kinds of noises um, computers made inside. So I got a... Just before they died? <laughs> yeah, before the smoke went up. They made this hiss sound. But uh, I, uh, I, I, my, my dad had bought me a 101 electronics kit that you could, from Radio Shack, you could do... Uh, you know, all these different uh, projects on. And I had a um, piezo earpiece. And uh, I really enjoyed hooking that to different parts of electronic circuits and just listening to them. And it, it was actually it's surprising how much you can um, understand about electronics just by the um, tones that they make. Um, you know, like the calculators would make different whirs when you uh, did different calculations and when they were in idle. Um, it's so actually, I've used that um, fairly recently. You know, if you need, you know, instead of having to look at a, a lot of things happening, you can actually probe onto a circuit and listen for sounds. And you know that, you know, the circuit that you're, you, you need to monitor is actually, you know, triggering or toggling because you can hear it. And then you can pay attention to another part of the circuit as you debug. 
So that was uh, kind of intuitively I came up with this debugging type uh, uh, technique. Um, I learned about um, you know what not to do with electronics a lot more than what to do with electronics at first. Um, I spent a lot of time exploding electrolytic caps by hooking them up the wrong direction, you know, and launching them at my brother. That was I'd, I'd take a wall wart and I'd hook it up to the electrolytic caps and plug it into the outlet in his room and then leave. And then, <laughs> then all of a sudden I'd hear the pop of the thing go off and all the white smoke and he'd come out and thump on me for a bit. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, so my dad was always a worry ward about me. He didn't want me to get injured, and uh, for good reason, because I was always doing crazy stuff like taking the backs off television and zapping the heck out of myself sometimes. I didn't even realize how dangerous the things were. But, you know, he tried, but he couldn't stop me. I was bullheaded. So um, the things like I made my own homemade soldering iron because he thought that I was going to burn the house down with, um, you know, a regular soldering iron. So I found uh, found that if you took a wire wound um, resistor and hook it to a power source, you could heat the whole thing. All the conformal coating burned off and probably it's giving me cancer today even. But anyway, you could solder with it. So, you know, all my soldering was done with this big, you know, two or three or four watt um, wire wound resistor. Uh, eventually he caught me with that. He smelled the smoke and he's like, okay, you know, if you're going to be doing it this way, we might as well get you a real soldering iron and I'll set you down and t show you how to do it correctly. Um, there was other things when I was a child. He didn't want me to have a telephone, so I had to make my own telephone. So my uh, little 1001 kit or whatever it was from Radio Shack, I figured out and an old tape deck, if I remember right. Um, I, I somehow rigged up a circuit where I could um, hear the dial tone and I could talk out on it. And I had a send-receive um, switch. So if I, you push it one way to talk and then you could listen the other way. And uh, I had a Morse code key for dialing out. So, you know, it's, I was really upset when my friends had numbers with zeros in them. Because you had to dial. <laughs> Ten, you hit it ten times and you had to do it at the right rate. But that's how I dialed out. And uh, he eventually caught me. Um, I tried to keep him from catching me by running all the phone lines into my, ha into my bedroom and then having to switch so I could turn his off. And, uh, you know, anyway. So, so eventually he caught me on that too and I could get a real phone. But... Uh, 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 the, it was hard for me to get electronic parts when I was a kid, so I had to um, harvest parts whenever I could out of um, old electronics. So I was, it started a trend that I do even today. I, I, I keep lots of electronics around, so in the middle of the night, four in the morning, I'm doing a circuit. I want to go find a transistor. I can just go search the boards, find it, pull it off, and use it. So it was... I did a lot of things like dumpster diving when I was a kid to try to get uh, electronics. And eventually my dad quit doing the, uh, um, the junk box when I got a little bit older, um, probably after stepping on capstans a few times. Um, yeah, we would, I, I started running into early mentors um, about this time. Uh, a kid up the street, um, he was a little bit older than me, he was he got one of these um, 101 kits also, and it had a radio transmitter circuit in it to transmit on AM radio. So we started having contests of uh, whose transmitter could transmit the farthest. And uh, we were going out and finding old AAR, AARL handbooks, ham radio handbooks, and trying to make linear amplifiers out of audio tubes and stuff. We got very exotic on these um, early transmitters. And uh, I would do things, I wouldn't tell them how I was cheating. I would uh, use the phone lines for my antenna. I'd just inductively couple a... Uh... <laughs> we, used to, we used to ride our bikes. We'd ride our bikes with our AM radios and we'd count the phone poles away from our houses. You know, how far away we were. And you never figured out why every time we went to a, you know, an intersection of where a phone pole was, mine would be much louder. <laughs> Yeah, at one point I damaged the phone lines to where they just quit working because I hooked a CB radio up to it and cheated up. 
Sidewalks. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> I didn't know. Um, so, yeah, uh, me and my friends, I, I ran into some electronic friends when I was a kid, that, and we got into doing the dumpster diving thing. Um, there was an electronic assembly house in town that um, had a dumpster out back that we found that they dumped all their defective boards into, and they would crunch a big hole through them with, like, a press or something. And then, but, you know, the chips around the edge were good. So I'd ride my bike nine miles um, into town, and then we'd meet up, you know, in the middle of the night on a weekend, and we would plan out our strategy of how we were going to, you know, stealthily you know, sneak up alongside this um, assembly house and crawl in the dumpster with our backpacks and load up all these circuit boards. And that was fun. And then we would, we would take them to my dad's gas station, and uh, he had a crucible for melting lead, and we would set the circuit boards We'd take the crucible out and we'd set the circuit board so where the flames would be coming up and touching the bottom of the circuit board. And we'd heat them up until the, um, the circuit board would, I mean, the solder would melt. And then we'd tip them over and we'd shake them real hard. You know, we were holding them with pliers and stuff. All the parts would fall out and we'd gather them up and we would uh, sort the good from the bad. Whether, amazingly enough, most of the stuff worked even after that torture of, uh, um, so, yeah, that's how I got a lot of parts. I went to swap meets, um, ham swap meets. There was a local swap meet. Um, I didn't have a lot of money, so I would take my allowance for a couple weeks or whatever and save up and get enough to enter the swap meet. You know, it would cost 8 or 9 or $10 to get into the swap meet. And then, then I would go around and I would just look at, you know, every vendor's booth and just, you know, I might have an extra $2, and I would carefully choose the one item out of the thousands of little surplus electronic parts that I was going to buy that year. And um, I, I learned um, right away, you know, how to, you know, start talking to these people and, you know, make them like you. And they would start um, taking pity on me and give me stuff after the swap meet. And after a few years of doing that, um, I would end up with so much stuff at the end of the swap meet that I couldn't possibly ride my bike and carry it in a backpack. So I would take it and I would hide it in the bushes outside the swap meet at this um, fairgrounds. And then over like three or four days, I would be taking these, you know, multiple trips on my bike back and forth to get this. I had all kinds of crazy stuff I was keying up. I had these old military surplus radios. Who knows what frequencies I was broadcasting on. Um, needless to say, I wasn't popular in school. Um, has anyone here ever uh, had trouble in school because they were nerdy? Um, so, yeah, I wasn't very popular, and I was pretty shy. Um, it was really holding me back. But, you know, uh, eventually, you know, I got picked on so much that one day I snapped. And uh, there was this kid that was always picking on me. He was picking, just, oh, he drove me nuts. And uh, was Coming into class, he said just the wrong thing, and I had a big biology book in my hand or math book or something. I took it like a discus, boom, across his face, knocked him out of his chair, and I ended up getting suspended. Um, my dad was mad at me again, like he always was. And uh, But when I came back, all of a sudden I had this new respect <laughs> in school. And so I was like, wow, you know, this is kind of cool. Everyone respects me. They're not teasing me anymore. And you know, I'm kind of considered wild and crazy. So that kind of led me into trying to find things like the race cars. Um, I, I, I decided that I needed to find other things that made me kind of wild. So I kind of went through this punk stage. And I, um, I decided that my father had raced cars when I was a kid from time to time. I was like, that's pretty cool. It's pretty wild. No one's done it. Um, I should get some respect out of that. So I started teaching myself how to weld. Um, talked my dad into teaching me how to weld. Um, said I wanted to do a race car. And he tried everything he could to uh, talk me out of it, but I was persistent. I was going to do it. I started enrolling in classes in high school to do metal shop and uh, started finding books and trying to get around people that did race cars so I could ask them questions. Um, I would, at this time, I was driving, uh, driving a car so I could go to the races on the weekend, and I would go down in the pit area afterwards, and I would just talk to people, you know, like, so where did you get your race car? How did you do this? How did you do that? I brought tape measures when they weren't looking. I'd go, just <laughs> I'd write it down in my little notebook. And 
um, I think I was 17, maybe 18, I, I put together my first race car, um, went out, went out on my first race. Um, I was so proud of this car. I thought, I'm going to be break the track record. So I go out there, first lap around on, you qualify, you do a qualifying lap, they measure your time and that positions you in the race. So I was like, I'm going, I'm going to be top spot tonight. And went around there and I was like, ooh, I'm going fast. And I pull in, I'm like, ah, oh, I must have the fast time of the night. Slow time of the night by two seconds, which is a lot. That's really slow. And oh, I should mention these are dirt cars, dirt race cars. So the first year I did terrible. I think I ended up 38th out of 40-ish, about 40 cars. But um, it, it got me the pats on the back, a lot of attention that I really needed at the time and um, respect from my, my peers, I guess. And uh, so I, I continued um, wanting to do better on the race cars. So I, I, I started looking around. I bought some more books and I found a guy in Florida that wrote a book. And I started calling him and pestering him, Duke, you know, I, what should I do? I'm having trouble. And somehow, after calling him and pestering him, he probably figured, well, just let her come out and work with me for, work with him for a week. So I went to Florida for a week and, and he mentored me in doing race car chassis design. He was an expert at doing NASCAR chassis and, and, I ended up finding out that there's a lot more to racing than a good car. There's a lot of psychology in racing, and we actually spent more time talking about the psychology of racing than in the, the actual dynamics of the car. So he, he taught me things like subterfuge is a big thing. You've got to throw off your competitors because they're always going to be trying to copy you. So I came back, and with what I learned, I started innovating my cars. You know, I'd, before I just copied a little bit off of everyone else's car and ended up with this really messed up car that just didn't drive good. So now I had all the basics and I was able to build a brand new car that um, did everything right. And uh, so I started doing good. I, I took seventh place the next year and people started copying me. So then the subterfuge started. So I, so I got to do some really fun things like you know, normally you ballast your race cars. You put lead in them in certain spots to um, balance their, their weight so you can go around a left-hand turn correctly. So I started making fake weights and putting them on my car. And uh, first I started out with just uh, in, you know, unusual places like on the right side of the car. And then I got a little more arrogant and I said, like, move it up on the right side of the car. <laughs> then I get really arrogant. I put it up in the driver's compartment up off the top of the roll bar. <laughs> things like that. And other things like um, putting red lights back recessed in the back of the car so they'd flash on so it looked like there were brake lights. And, uh, you know, other things when you were racing, you know, tapping the other cars gently before the race starts. You just come up and you nudge them a little bit. You know, you can really throw people off by... Um, bumping them. Or if there was, you know, you have a restart condition where cars are, are, are lined up after a crash. So you line up front to tail. And if you're in the back and you want to pass this guy in front of you, you pull up alongside him and go, hey, you know, give him the thumbs up and you pull back. And this is all during the yellow flag as they're cleaning up a mess. Then you pull forward again and you go, hey, you just keep pulling up to the top side of him. And then when the race starts, you almost always go up to the top and you're ready to go right underneath them. Works wonderful. I use that so much. They never caught on, these knuckleheads out there. <laughs> so I started developing, I started stealing ideas from um, airplanes and from Indy cars and Formula One cars. I started like, okay, you know, planes are the strongest, lightest thing out there. So I got to get around people and get around information about airplanes. So I found out, you know, what materials they used in planes and found that I could go to Boeing Surplus, pick up really exotic honeycomb metal to use for floorboards and um, started using chromoly tubing where none of the other racers were using that kind of tubing, making the cars really light and designing um, candelabra front suspensions, you know, with all kinds of subterfuge built into them so it looked like they worked one way but it actually worked a different way. Um, so... 
yeah, I started doing really good, started selling a lot of cars, um, chassis. People wanted to buy my chassis. And I kind of made a little mini um, assembly line in my dad's gas station. So I had this fixture where I could build all the cars pretty much the same. I would just bend up the tubing, throw it into the fixture, weld it up really quick, and then uh, and I could just turn these things out making, you know, eight nine hundred dollars a pop on them which is a lot of money you know <laughs> well you know what I'm 19 or 20 so I was like wow this is great and and some part par, some point along the way I just gave up on high school I mean I was doing the race cars I was making money winning races and you know I was very happy so I was like that's ah, not for me so I quit going and so the, the race cars went real well um, I found some ways to really promote myself around the track to make myself even more popular because sometimes having um, the audience behind you is almost as important as actually doing well on a small track. So if, if the audience really likes you and there's like an iffy condition where who, who, was, who won, you know, if there's a lot of booing and hissing and stuff, sometimes there were like some reversals of uh, calls. Um, I, at some point I was winning so many trophies I got tired of the trophies so I decided to go into the audience and just find the first kid that I could find and I just here you want my trophy and boy did that make me popular <laughs> and, uh, it was you know after the races I would cross over after I'd finished my race and just be whoosh, swarms of kids and, and that gave me even more motivation to do better because you know if I didn't win a trophy then there'd be all these disappointed kids like ah <laughs> And, uh, so when did you raise enough money for Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan so they could fly What? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. That was my racing. Um, I did a lot of innovation in there, and um, it was a lot of mentors. So I, a lot of people helped me. Um, but, you know, it really scared me a lot. Um, I liked all the attention, and it really fed that part of my ego. But... Um, it was hard work. I was getting scars from welding so much, and it was tearing my lungs up and everything else. So I said, I gotta, gotta move on. So I, I was looking. At, it was at some point I was seeking something else, and I was sitting in the garage with um, one of my high school buddies, and he was showing me. I think it was a 386 at the time. He's like, this machine costs a thousand dollars, and somehow he had acquired a price list for um, wholesale parts that he could buy and he's like look at this you could put the same machine together for seven hundred dollars and it's like whoa three to four hundred dollars profit you know and I'm not having to lift heavy things and trying to get people to help me you know flip race cars over I go let's start a computer store so so I sold off I I just dumped um, most of my race car stuff. I was just, I, that's it. I'm going into computers. So I sold off the last of my chassis, sold a bunch of my welding equipment, and it's got, I don't know, maybe $6,000 or so. And we went and we opened this computer store. And uh, this, this store, after three or four months, was really taking off. Um, again, more mentors helped me out. Um, Across the street from where we opened the computer store was an insurance agent, and he was a big computer nut. And uh, you got to realize I'd never grown out of my kind of punk, wild look. So here I'm trying to sell computers, these thousand-dollar investments for people, you know, and I'm just like not looking the part. But he he took a, he was very patient with me. Came over, um, would hang out on his lunch hour and would um, make gentle suggestions like, well, maybe you should read this book, you know, how to win friends, influence people, <laughs> skill with people, and he would bring them over and give them to me. It's like, maybe you should change the way you dress, maybe you dress a little bit better. And it was very difficult because, you know, I, I kind of admired where he was because he was a successful business owner and I wanted to go where he was going. But then again, I had all my friends that were pulling me back. They were like, Jerry, you're selling out. What, you know, why are you wearing these clothes? Why are you talking differently? You know, come on, let's go party until the middle of the night. And so that was a hard part in my life where I had to bust away from the old and go to the new where I wanted to go. And um, mentor helped me out there. 
So the computer store is doing well, and me and my partner start to have some issues. Um, so it, it kind of gets nasty, and at one point we have lawyers coming in. And so he's hired a lawyer out of the general fund, and I'm hiring a lawyer out of my, um, my money, and we start fighting. And eventually I just, I couldn't, I was just losing all my money, so I just, I got to walk out. I, I, had, I had lost all my money. I was down to I had probably $800 in the bank. I just couldn't fight anymore. So I walked out on the, on the business and went, went to my apartment, and I was just, just oh, so sad. I couldn't believe it. You know, this, I put so much effort into this computer store, and it, you know, here I'm pretty much lost it all. And I started asking people, what should I do? And I got a lot of suggestions like, well, you should just go get a regular job, you know, and just build yourself up again. So I was sitting around and I started like, I, he can't do that to me. You know, I'm not going to let him do that to me. So I, I call, I start, oh man, I would. <laughs> Lawyer books are heavier. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not the fake ones, of course. <laughs> so, I uh, so I I started looking around for a place that was just down the street from his, and I found this little tiny place. I think it was only 500 square feet, or it was just the tiniest closet of a retail space. It used to be a barber shop, and so I I called my landlord at my apartment, said I'm moving out. I need my deposits back as soon as possible. So I. I moved out, went in. I was staying with friends. I was hopscotching around with friends so I could have a place to stay. And I rented this place, took all my money, invested in it to get the store fixtures. And I moved into the back of it. There was this little sliver of um, storeroom in the back that had a, a, a sink and a toilet at one end. And I lived in the back of this thing. I didn't have any product. So again, back to dumpster diving. I went to my competitor, to my old store, and I would dumpster dive into the um, the garbage, and I would get the colorful boxes that were for the product. So I, I, I mean, I had nothing. I was so poor. I was eating ramen noodles and corn dogs, and you know, my dad would take pity on me. I'd go over to his house to take a shower or something. He'd be like, "Oh, here, eat, eat, eat," you know, and he'd send me home with stuff. And but, <laughs> <laughs> the difference is, <laughs> so people would come in and I'd be like, I want that sound card that's there, you know, this big colorful box or whatever. I'm like, you know, that one's sold, but if you give me your money or a deposit on it, you know, two or three days I'll have one here for you. So I played this shell game for quite a few months of someone would come in, order a machine, and I wouldn't, like, okay, you have to leave a half deposit which wasn't enough to build the machine. So now I'm sweating. And I'm like, okay, I've got to, you know, pay rent, build the machine, or wait for another person to come in and put a deposit down so I could get enough money to have all the machines built. And, uh, yeah, I played that game. But I was also hell-bent to put that other guy out of business. So I, I would not be undersold. I'd actually lose money, even though, you know, I didn't have any money at the time. I would go ahead and um, sell it below cost if I even sensed that um, you know they were going to go to my competitor. So I, I built this momentum up. People, I got the reputation of being a wheeler dealer, and um, so the store just started growing, growing, growing. Pretty soon, I could move out, get a real apartment again, and then I had people working for me. Um, people would come on shipment days, and they. would They'd have to wait outside because they'd be bringing the pallets and we'd be busting the pallets down right there in the store and trying to inventory them real quick. And like, John, here's your sound card that you've been waiting for. And it was just this really exciting thing. And, you know, over the next year, I moved the store twice to bigger and bigger locations, hired more employees. And over the next couple of years, I kept opening more and more stores. So I ended up with five stores at one point. And that worked really well for a few years. Um, but then the, the mark... All the same that you grew up in? Uh, no, nearby. nearby. Um, my business model was that I would go open up stores in small communities that I could generate a lot of loyalty 
and provide a service and then hopefully charge you know 10 15 percent more than a big chain store but I kind of got blindsided I didn't see the change in technology coming um, windows got better quit crashing so much so there was a little bit of my revenue that wasn't coming in from um, messed up windows um, installs um, hardware the smoke and mirrors of um, faster machines um, kind of thing happened where um, machines a, a jump from a 100 megahertz machine to a 233 megahertz machine felt like twice as fast but as the machines got faster and faster on normal applications it didn't feel as fast so there was a lot less upgrading of the machines so people were hanging on to their machines longer with their numbers actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. so, um, yeah, so I, I kind of lost, I got blindsided. I didn't realize that this was all happening and it happened really quick. In 99, um, I started hemorrhaging money really quick, um, having all these stores and lots of employees. And I, I, I'd had slow times before and I figured, well, I can just wait this out, you know, and I don't want to get rid of, I. I found these great employees, but you know I, I don't want to get rid of them. So I started losing tons of money on wages, and um, pretty soon, by the end of '99, it was pretty obvious that you know I was going broke. So this entire time that I was doing the race cars, the um, computer stores, I was also doing electronics. Um, and the computer stores, having that money around, allowed me to get tools. So I started getting some of the early um, CPLD and FPGA tools, and um, I, would, I was heavily experimenting with programmable logic at the time. So at 99, 2000, I decided that you know I need a change again. I'm, go I'm losing money here. The stores aren't quite as fun as they used to be. So I sold them, sold them off, and closed a couple of them. And I went on this crash course of teaching myself how to do um, chip design. That's where I wanted to go. So having these stores up around the Portland area, I had made some contacts with some, uh, you know, Intel people and people at Maxim and uh, people that were, they saw that I was excited about where I wanted to go and they were willing to share their, their knowledge with me. So... Um, I, I reduced my overhead. I moved into a, I started renting a room from a, yeah, paying like $100, $150 a month renting a room and started just crash course learning um, CPLD, FPGA, you know, chip design. And uh, um, one of my friends um, suggested that, well, maybe you should do some kind of proof of concept or a, a demo of what you can do. So that's where I was like, I, you know, I kind of wanted to pay tribute to my old um, computer that I had um, grown up on and loved, the Commodore 64. Hey, quit <laughs> quitting the dance. Um, so I thought, well, it would be really neat to um, to do, to reverse engineer that and put it into these programmable logic chips because they were just getting to the density where you could do an 8-bit machine, maybe across one or two of them. So I started, I took a Commodore 64 apart and I hooked an FPGA up to um, individual chips inside and I started to um, reverse engineer each of the chips, figuring out, you know, what their quirks were. Um, and I found out that a lot of times a data sheet doesn't represent what the quirks are inside of a, a chip. And this machine, a lot of uh, programmers had... Um, figured out these little quirks of the chips, the unknown states of certain uh, register combinations, and they started to exploit those for, so, you know, a lot of times I would make a behavioral model and it's like, it doesn't work. You know, why is this not working? So I had, I started seeking out the engineers, the original Commodore engineers, and started, um, you know, trying to get them to tell me what, what was going on, you know, inside these chips. And I, I made contact with a few and, of course, a lot of them couldn't remember because it was 25 years ago or 20 years ago. And uh, but they gave me some insight. Um, some of my friends, I had a friend that worked at Electroglass, and he we decapped some of the chips and we photographed them. We looked at some of the structures inside, and we're like, oh, yeah, I can see the data paths going through here. I, I think I have a an idea. And here's a counter. We think this is a counter over here, and it's only one counter driving all this stuff, and that explains why there's 
funny bit combinations that come off this counter that cause things to happen. And so I, I started slowly replacing the chips inside the Commodore 64. Um, I, 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 before that point, I didn't realize people really played with Commodores anymore. So I started looking around the web as I was researching, like, does anyone know about um, you know, how these Commodores work? And I, I found little groups of fanatics that really like to play with the old machines. And some of them are in the audience here. So. <laughs> We won't look at who. Yeah, Robert. Um, so, so um, I was like, wow, there's people that get together two and three times a year that play with these old Commodores. Like, what a blast, you know? So I decided to just get a plane ticket and go out to one of these little mini conventions and met up with um, some Commodore people out there. And the first show I went to, I, I walked in with this Commodore where I was working on the video chip. Um, to replace the video chip, I walked in and I was like, you know, I, I don't know if you guys would be interested in this or not, but, you know, I, I have, the, I'm trying to reverse engineer the whole C64 and here's this little video card thing that I made and they, their mouths dropped and they're like, oh, wow, that's cool, cool, cool. And uh, they're like, well, you should start selling this stuff because all our Commodores are dying and they started making suggestions of improvements. And uh, so... I was just doing this because I, it was fun and it was heading, it was making me head in the right direction. I didn't realize that people would actually want, you know, old retro equipment to play with, or even to um, a retro equipment that's been enhanced, like with IDE drives and stuff like that. So all these suggestions start coming in, like, well, can you do that? I said, uh, yeah, I think I can add an IDE drive. Yeah, I think I can make it address a gigabyte of SD RAM. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually this, this thing started to morph as I started to figure out all the chips into this development board um, it's called C1. It's what we uh, kind of... It kind of landed with that name, like Computer One or Commodore One or whatever you want to call it. But it had things like IDE ports on it. It had Compact Flash. It had SD RAM. It had um, audio DACs, all kinds of um, added features on it, fast serial. And uh, I slowly started to make it Commodore compatible. And so this is fun and, and, and doing this stuff. And I start getting little... Uh, in the meantime, I, I'd run out of money, so I had to go out and find a job. Um, so I went to an electronics store in the Portland area and said, you know, I need two or three days worth of work. I have um, good sales um, background. I know about electronics. You know, can you hire me just to work for two or three days? And uh, so anyway, I got a job there. And immediately, within like the first or second week, I was number one in sales. I was just using all my skills from my retail stores of like people would come in, um, you know, I'm doing this project. I need a couple LEDs. I'm like, oh, you need a couple LEDs? How about the series resistors for those? How about a piece of perf board? You know, do you need a, a case for that? And, you know, all these upselling stuff. And pretty soon the, the, the electronic store is like, wow we got to get you in here on more days. I was like, no, 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 no. I don't want to work any more days. I'm trying to teach myself um, chip design. I need this extra time to do other stuff. And they started putting pressure on me to come in. And uh, eventually I had to quit because they were like, well, we're going to fire you if you don't um, you know, start working uh, extra days. We really need you here. It's like, well, fine. I quit. So I quit. And what's what's funny is going back there, Today, the, the manager always comes out and he's like, we could really use you. Could you, could you come and, and, and come work for us and manage our Portland store or our Salem store? And it's like, no, nah, you can't afford me anymore. <laughs> so, um, but working at that computer store, I found enough little, uh, I networked with people enough that came through there um, to get my foot in the door at various little companies to do small projects. Um, I did a solvent still controller for a, a solvent machine that would 
pull in solvent, boil it, condense it, clean it up, and then let it go out to a, a clean source. And uh, did uh, various things like solar power controllers and various things that kind of got me into the, got my foot in the door. And that was very difficult, getting in the door, having no education, you know, formal education to speak of. Um, so I was happily doing all these little um, little projects, and all of a sudden I got an email out of the blue from a company over in Britain that said that um, we're involved with a company that made a joystick that um, can play old Atari games, and um, we want to do a Commodore one. And um, we found that, you know, an Atari one, we emulated it on a faster processor. But we found the Commodore is so complicated with its, you know, it had very complicated um, video and sound and peripherals. And they couldn't do it on a low cost. It would cost them way too much to emulate it. They're like, well, can we do something to, um, to make a, a cheap ASIC based on your Commodore 1 technology? It's like, oh, sure, no problem. It's like, yes. Here's my chance to do a chip. So I, I started researching, you know, how I could take all my RTL and convert it to, uh, you know, do a gate array with it. And, uh, you know, I told them, I gave them a figure, and then they disappeared. You know, they said, oh, probably too expensive or something, I guess. And, uh, you know, it was six months later, I was just happily doing, you know, little jobs again. And here comes another company out of Canada we want to do a, a joystick that's a Commodore. And it's like, well, hey, I, you know, here it is. I just just changed the, the title of the document that I said to the other, the other company and said, this is how much it'll cost. And uh, it's like, well, that's just so expensive. We can't do it. And so they disappeared. And then a, a couple months later, I got a call from Mammoth Toys in the States. And they're like, we want to do this. Same thing, here's what we need to do. And they're like, well, that's too expensive. We're, we're worried about the risk. Maybe they just didn't trust me or, or something. Um, so they're like, well, would you take a royalty on it? I was like, yeah, I'd take a royalty. And I threw out a figure. I thought it was you know, a crazy figure on the, from what they were um, saying that they were going to sell you know, in total volume. So they came back and said, yeah, sure, we'll take that um, that royalty and plus a, a lump sum to get going. And so, but the the deal is we need it done in two months. <laughs> and the other people, I told them, well, it's going to take six months. We're going to have to do testing. We're going to have to get prototypes. We're going to have to bring prototypes in, test those, make sure they're good. And they're like, no, we have to have these this done in two months. Luckily, I had a lot of the IP done um, for the on the C1. Um, at that time, the C1 was being manufactured by it still is being manufactured by a German company, licensed it, and they're distributing it. So I started um, just just killing myself trying to get this thing done so we could. Um, you see, in toys, there are certain dates that you have to get things done so they can get shipped. They need to go on a boat. Huh. I know, but Chris is six months early in that business. Yeah, it is. Yep. <coughs> so, I, was like, I told him right up front, I was like, I just don't know if I can get this done in two months so you can have it ready for the end of July to get it on the boat and ship it across, but you know, I'll try. You know, that's my typical style. Like, uh, you know, people, can you do this? Sure. And then I walk away, I'm like, oh, my God, what did I get myself <laughs> into? But I started cramming on this thing. And um, got it, it got it going. Now they're saying, well, we're going to have to do a risk run. And that's where you run all the wafers through untested. You don't run a prototype run first. You just no prototypes. So uh, send it off. And I keep finding bugs as they're making the mask sets. And I call them, ah, don't run it through yet. <laughs> We've got to change the, change the design a bit. I found a bug. And. So finally, we release the code. They run it through um, a month and a half later or so. They come back. They shipped uh, the samples off to um, Hong Kong to make some prototypes. Um, in the meantime, I'd made a circuit board for what should be inside this video game controller. And I, I get word back from them. It doesn't work. I say, oh, my God. 
doesn't work. I was like, okay, am I going to run to Canada or am I going to go to Mexico to hide from these people because it's a lot of money involved. Because they, they did an initial, they just ran 250,000 um, chips through all at one time. And they had already made all the tooling for the plastic. They would made the circuit boards ahead of time. And I was like, oh. And so they threw, I was like, okay, well, we got to figure it out. So they threw me on a plane, flew me over to Hong Kong. And we went in, and I started looking. We, we got some of the um, pilot run units, and I cracked one open. And I looked at it, and I was like, this isn't my circuit board that I sent over here. What's going on? <laughs> and they're like, well, all those parts you put on there were too expensive. It's like, uh, the decoupling capacitors were too expensive. <laughs> so they had removed, they had, not, they had changed the board to have no decoupling capacitors. Um, they had cut the board in half or in a third quarter or something and so they could have a, a single-sided phenolic board for a couple buttons at the top and they'd rather solder um, individual wires than have a one-sided board instead of a two-sided board in there. So I'm like, okay, well, so I, I started pressing on the board and bloop, it came up. I was like, okay, it works. <laughs> so, but it's just bad circuit board layout. So I started analyzing it and I was like, okay, the ground plane is split in half and it has a seven mil trace connecting the two sides. <laughs> yeah, this half of the ground plane's an antenna, thank you. And uh, <laughs> so, I, so I run some big heavy wire across and show them, and I put some bulk capacitance on it, and uh, I'm like, okay, this is what we need done. And they're like, okay, we'll do that. And so I wait around for two or three days, and the prototypes come back, and I open it up. Not a decoupling capacitor on the thing. I said, so we try to fire it up, it kind of works. I'm like, it has to have decoupling capacitors running at 32 megahertz. You cannot have it running with no decoupling. Um, terrible stuff. Um, we ended up, we went around two or three times um, with circuit boards with me like, you put a capacitor here, right here, you hear me? Here. <laughs> and uh, finally we got it to work and I did the pilot run and we started to have uh, random failures on the, production line like, oh no what's going on and, and come to find out I forgot to clear one of my flip-flops in the design and it was coming up to a random state it's like oh my goodness how am I gonna how am I gonna fix this now so I start looking through the RTL and I and I call the um, the company that did the gate array for us and like what can we do and they're like well you know there's a, a global clear that we put on there for scan insertion the scan chain like, ah yes so so I had a little 10 cent um, 74 LS 74 in there so I could strobe the uh, the um, global clear and then I would strobe my clear and poof got it to work 100% reliable <laughs> it was it was about one out of five wouldn't start up because the um, flop would start high. So I got very lucky there. Um, so they they only had one customer, and I was skeptical that um, they were going to sell very many units. Um, they made 250,000 of these things, and uh, so the the buzz was going around the web that this thing was coming out in the little kind of retro communities. And so QVC was the company that was going to sell them. And I'd never watched QVC before. So we, uh, a bunch of us got on IRC, you know, Commodore Fanatics and stuff. And we, we were sitting there at midnight the night before it went on sale. It was going to be some special daily value. And it was going to be on once an hour or an hour, you know, through the, through the day. Um, so at midnight, we're all sitting there watching it. At midnight, they had a little counter. The thing sold like 3,000 in the middle of the night. And I was like, whoa. And then I went, dollar signs, whoa. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, yeah, they pretty much sold out in less than a month on the things. It was amazing the, um, the leverage that television shopping has. So the... The current revision, they're doing more. There's more in the pipe. They're coming. They've um, they had me doing other 
designs. Uh, they have me doing three total other designs, a lot of video game stuff and some non-video game stuff. Um, now, it, the New York Times ran an article on this, like here's this, uh, you know, high school dropout becomes successful, and, and I guess that's how I ended up here. It's uh, probably the New York Times article. And, uh, yeah, I've got tons and tons of work, and that's, uh, that's about, that's my story. I guess like we could go into questions if, uh, if we want to go lower level than this. Are you still working on the royalty? Yes, yes. <laughs> that was such a good deal. It's funny, they pay me more in the royalty on this stuff than they would have, they would have just trusted and went ahead. So, yeah, they had me do a, um, a European version, so I have a PAL version, so I had to to um, figure out how PAL works, which is kind of an odd uh, oddball from what I was used to. Did they put in the capacitors that time? Well, we'll see. The pilot runs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the pilot's running. When I get home, there's probably going to be a sample there, yeah. so we'll see. I, I looked. I approved this time. I was like, okay, send me a, uh, a snapshot of the um, the, the PCB. It's so crazy over there. They, they did everything backwards in the factory. They, I sent them a schematic, and I go, I can export a net list to, for you so you can enter it into your layout tool. And I go, oh, we don't need that. So I go over there, and there, here's this thing that they made. And uh, it's like, do you have a schematic, your schematic that you entered? And they're like, well, we don't use schematic. They just, they just start placing parts on the circuit board, and they just start drawing lines. And uh, they go, well, we can make you a schematic. <laughs> so they they went backwards. So. Can you say something about the FPGA tools you used? And the sure. Um, for the C1, I used the Cordis um, free tools. I, so I started out with um, Warp um, for Cypress parts. I did a lot of experimenting with Cypress parts. Um, Altair and Xilinx were kind of racing at the time when I wanted to do the C1 board for density, and it happened that Altera had the highest density per cost part. So that's why I ended up using Altera. And so I've used the free tools, and they're adequate. I even used the Altera free tools to do my RTL and simulations for um, all the Gatorades that I do with. Um, so I can. Now, the same RTL you use for the ASIC layer? But we have to modify it slightly. So. You know, I, I go on site at the chip company and then um, we do some floor planning and we put I.O. rings around it and stuff like that. But uh, more or less, I almost I just pick it up straight and give it to them and they just change some of the periphery, insert scan chain through it so that it can be tested. Um, it works out really well because doing video is very complicated. Um, it takes about five hours to do one frame of video on a, on a, on a simulation. It was, yeah. That's, well, that's with all of the um, post layout timing and stuff. You only have to do one of those. But it's still, it takes a long time for those things to simulate. And uh, How long did it take to put your former partner out of business? Oh, he was gone within less than a year. <laughs> <laughs> I have like this evil side to me. Yeah. Could, could you focus that on Gates? <laughs> that would take a little bit of work. You showed me you'd put some uh, extra peripheral connectors on the board uh, for keyboards. And stuff. <coughs> oh, yeah. Have, have a lot of people uh, made use of it or what's going yeah, on? Yeah, so uh, I almost forgot about that. That was the coolest thing I thought about. the. Huh? Yeah, help me out here. The, so I wanted to give back to the hacker kind of community. Um, yeah, I had this entire Commodore 64 on a chip. I mean, everything was in there, the video, sound, and even disc controller and keyboard controller and stuff. So I was like, i got to expose these pins so that you can open up this um, controller and hook a PS2 keyboard up to it and hook a disc interface up to it and load your own games in or use it like a real Commodore. And uh, so I conspired with the software people. I was like, okay, if the K key is pressed, we're going to drop out of their automated menuing system and you're going to drop into real Commodore Basic. And so that stuff leaked out. 
how how to um, hook a keyboard and disk to it. There's someone that was really smart and uh, and hacked it right away, like within the same day that it launched. Um, it was kind of tricky to keep Hong Kong from optimizing it out. Um, okay, there's three audio channels that came out of the chip. Um, this is just an example of how they tried to optimize things. We, go, we see that you have three audio pins that kind of hook together through this, you know, low-pass network, um, capacitor network. You know, can't you just eliminate two of those and just have one? Like, no, you can't just eliminate three of the channels. Um, but they were looking at all these um, pull-up resistors I put on. Of course, the I.O. ring. I already had pull-up resistors on the I.O. ring. It doesn't need to be there. But I had to make sure that they actually bonded the, um, bonded the die. So I was like, yeah, these resistors are very, very important. We've got to have these here because that's part of the circuit. And I actually got them to label it keyboard clock, keyboard data, <laughs> disk data. <laughs> And that it actually came in useful um, in the end because um, somewhere there was a, a communication problem with the software programmers that made the um, software in the in the unit. Um, they forgot to put a test uh, test case in there to test all the micro switches and all the um, sound. So we actually used the disk interface and a um, and a uh, a little microcontroller to initialize the. Um, so it would drop it into basic, it would type load, test, comma, comma one, and load up the test program right on the production line. So every unit had gets clumped uh, onto, onto and it gets the test run using the hack. Yes, exactly. So we actually test the keyboard and got this interface at every shipping unit. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> or the rest of it's tested. Yeah. No, but what is the amazing thing is, okay, they're supposed to be tested. But, um, you know, since I was pretty close with, the, with all the Commodore community that was buying a bunch of these things, um, I kept hearing these, you know, reports coming back. Oh, I've got a joystick. It doesn't have any sound. And I'm like, well, open it up and look at this, this, and this. And I go, oh, there's no resistors there. <laughs> like, uh, well, there were supposed to be resistors there. And, you know, some of them were just dead. So it was kind of, kind of amazing. I, they say they test it, but, uh, you know, maybe some slip by. <laughs> yes. How did you deal with the intellectual property from Commodore? Oh, I didn't have to deal with that at all. It actually worked out very good for me because I was doing the C1 board. Um, maybe I should go back and talk about the C1 board a bit more after this. But um, the C1 board, I was just doing that without even talking to anyone. So we were selling this board without any, any rights to it, and we were just assuming that people would go download the ROMs and put them on there, and it was just a workalike. So when I was contacted by Mammoth Toys, I got written into the contract that I, I get to have exclusive rights. That they negotiated with whoever owned Commodore at the time um, to have exclusive rights. And then somehow it, we, we trickled it down to where in my contract I had exclusive rights to do it on the C1. So it actually, doing this joystick um, protects me with my C1 project. And to go back with the C1, the C1 um, evolved from just a Commodore 1 thing to, um, to a general purpose emulation board that has two <coughs> FPGAs on it that um, other people are writing cores for it. There's Schneider CPC, there's VIC-20, and there's others in the work, Apple IIs, stuff like that, that other people are working on. So it's kind of a generic um, reconfigurable board now. Generic <laughs> A consumer yeah, computer. Yeah, it works very well for 8-bit. Um, there's not very much logic in it, so you probably couldn't do very many 16-bit uh, machines on it. 16-bit CPUs are pretty heavy in registers. And Another five or ten years. Oh, yeah. Oh, the densities in FPGAs are just skyrocketing. It's great for, um, for uh, you know, if you have a product that can afford, you know, that kind of money for an FPGA. Now that everybody knows that there are these extra connectors on the board, is the game company going to insist that you leave them out on the next revision? We had some uh, squabbles about that, but we ended up leaving them in there. Um, the, the squabbles were more about the Easter eggs that the programmers put into the software. The, um, I insisted that there was a full programming document inside because I put extensions into the, um, the, 
the Commodore 64, so it had higher resolution graphics and better sound and um, a, a blitter for moving graphics around the screen um, rapidly. So I squeezed all that stuff in there. And uh, in the doc there's a document that you can wiggle the joystick the right way and do a couple things and you can get it to come up and it tells you how to interface to the, um, the keyboard and uh, how to access all these extended registers. So. So when are you going to go to your game engine that's going to compete with Sony? And I'm working that way. Um, uh, Mammoth has actually asked me to work on a simple 3D engine, um, and it's it's uh, it's really a stretch. I didn't tell them that uh, I could have it done anytime soon, but I'm I'm really, you know, they want everything. Toy companies want everything cheap, so I'm I'm exploring fixed point 3D graphics. A lot of Atari um, arcade machines use it, so I'm I'm delving in. I've actually got some emails out trying to, you know, get into, you know, work with mentors on that. It's, uh, you know, Bayard, you're talking about doing some educational things, too. Is anybody uh, any classrooms taking this and reversing it, or is this another <coughs> platform you're looking at? The, uh, the C1 board or the... Uh, yeah. Uh, the, uh, actually, I'm doing a Spanish-English um, learning toy. Um, it's kind of a PDA, um, just off-the-shelf parts. It's not. Uh, it's nothing really. I, I tried to talk them into doing an, a gate array. I could have integrated everything into it, and made it a lot cheaper for them. But they don't want to risk. So, so I'm trying to. On the edu the, the company is having to do the educational stuff. I'm trying to work on getting them to. Uh, you know, stretch a bit on that and do their own chips. Because uh, there's a reason that um, Mammoth is now, they're really excited about doing their own chips. They have, they want to do their own chips on everything. Is There's a lot of knockoff products in China where, um, you know, they might manufacture five for you and one for themselves and send it out the back door. And having the ICs, which are pretty low cost, manufactured in the U.S., it's a dongle that they can... Um, they can monitor, so there's no way to make them without it, and uh, they can control it. So they're actually, they could go and shave off a few pennies on the ICs by going to an overseas company, but it's worth it to them to not have the losses of having them go out the back door. Dolby's doing a disk drive for movie projectors that interfaces to the projector in such a way so that you can't copy it just, just to keep the same thing going. And yeah. they've They've always sold intellectual property, now they're having to sell hardware, which is kind of strange. Yeah, sometimes you have to do that. Yeah, it's just a bigger scale or more expensive scale that they're uh, having to do that. Okay. <laughs> worth keeping. In my opinion, no, but as far as the bean counters at uh, Mammoth, yes. Um, one of the things that upset me quite a bit is I, I wanted this to be a, a low power um, design, so I, on the schematic I put a, a regulator, it was a low dropout regulator. Um, they designed in one of their generic um, discrete regulators that used uh, an LED as a Zener diode and it just consumes tons of current, just burns it. So unfortunately these don't have the same um, battery life that they would have you know, if you didn't have that linear regulator, just burning current for no reason. What kind of, what kind of uh, power do they use? You know, I don't have that figure off the top of my head. It's fairly low. Um, it's done in 0.35 micron. It's 32 megahertz. I gated um, a lot of the registers in there, so they're not transitioning unnecessarily. The, the new design, I worked even more on gating the, um, the, the, clock, uh, gating the clock to areas or using clock enables, I should say, not gating entire domains of clocks, but um, it's pretty low power. I don't, I don't have it off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Okay. How do you handle timing things on this? I mean, the classic problem with emulators in the gaming world is that uh, your race car goes 600 miles an hour in the space of meters come down and kick your ass before you... Can you, can you speak up a bit? I'm yeah, sorry, uh, the, the classic problem in a lot of gaming things is timing. I mean, you, You've done the emulator on a faster processor, and now your race car goes 600 miles an hour, and 
you know, the space invaders come down and kick your ass before you've done anything. Well, that's it. I'm glad you asked that because I haven't gone into great detail about the architecture of the design. It's actually a cycle accurate um, piece of hardware. There's only a few places in there where I have um, logic running at a faster rate than the original Commodore 64. So it runs at 1.02 megahertz you know, throughout the design. There's a few places there's some very hard things to do um, on we couldn't, I was not allowed to use a mixed signal design, so I didn't have DACs in there. So I had to do sigma converters for the audio. So those have to really be screaming along at a fast frequency. Um, the, I'm sorry? Your IDE controller, I would think, would, would uh, disk, would, can you, uh, can you, can, doesn't the disk want you to speak with that? Uh, um, well, that's, that's different. Um, you can actually speed the processor up. There's some switches you can set and, and go into a turbo mm -hmm. mode. But um, it's, it's gated at a, a clock that's um, synchronous with the original Commodore 64. So this is cycle accurate. And that actually became a big problem because the original programmers of the Commodore games would time their, their CPU um, accesses to the raster line going across, and then they would, and this is part of the quirks of the chips, they would flip bits in um, the video chip at certain times, which would confuse the video chip and make it go off and do something else, but it became a useful um, mm -hmm. video feature. So very crucial about, you know, the timing across a raster line. And actually, I spent a lot of time with a real Commodore 64 with, um, I kind of genlocked over, um, different signals so I could see them on the screen, you know, where they were happening. So I'd be watching this, I'd have a set reset flop where I could turn on, you know, a white bar that would go across the raster line and I'd see where it'd turn off on the original Commodore 64. Then I, in my FPGA simulation I was doing, I would do the same set reset and I'd go, oh, I'm off by three cycles here, so now I need to drag it back, um, find out where I'm going wrong. It just, it took a long time to, uh, to, to get it cycle accurate. Um, uh, one or two megahertz. Box and, and usually a vertical refresh. And then, then you don't have to worry about the speedy emulator once. Yeah, that's that. That's true. Uh, a lot of these early machines were very fixed to the um, to the the master clock. Um, uh, only on one twenty eight. Only on Commodore one twenty eight. Uh, the C sixty four could handle that. That was a bug in the one twenty eight. So there's. So at this point, we should probably stop with the produce section. Uh, and go offline now. Um, people are welcome to stick around. I'm sure you'll be here to answer questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you.